in the book, I look at other countries that all have their justifications for passing fake news laws, and they don't have anything like the First Amendment or anything even close. And they're able to do it. And they have all of their rational justifications that misinformation is poisoning democracy and all, all, all of their reasons. But even in sort of the Western democracies, what you see is politicians, once they get power, they will use that power for their own ends and they and they will use it to suppress dissent and you see that with regulations on false speech so i think the self-governance theory when you combine it with marketplace and some other reasons i think that paints a fuller picture of why it becomes dangerous to start whittling away at the first amendment i'm alan rosenstein associate professor of law at the university of minnesota and senior editor at lawfare and this is the Lawfare Podcast for October 6th, 2023. The First Amendment protects speech, but what kind? True speech, sure. But what about false or misleading speech? What if the speech is harmful? After all, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Or can you? To answer these questions, I spoke with Jeff Kossoff, who's an associate professor of cybersecurity law in the United States Naval Academy's Cyber Science Department, and who's also a contributing editor at Lawfare. Jeff is releasing his latest book this month, titled Liar in a Crowded Theater, Freedom of Speech in a World of Misinformation, in which he describes and defends the First Amendment's robust protections for false and misleading speech. I spoke with Jeff about the book, why you sometimes can yell fire in a crowded theater, and how new technology both supercharges misinformation and provides new tools to fight it. It's the Lawfare Podcast, October 6th, Jeff Kossoff on why the First Amendment protects false speech. Before we get into the book, let me ask a question that uh, I've been wondering about for a while. One of the things that you are well known for, besides your general expertise on all things First Amendment, is your allergic reaction, especially on Twitter, whenever anyone claims that you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. And so I would just love to start by asking you why you dislike that statement so much. I mean, is it really the case that you can yell fire in a crowded theater? I mean, it seems at least uh, Representative Jamal Bowman re- recently found out that at the very least you shouldn't pull a fire alarm in a crowded House of Representatives. Yeah, so I think for the Bowman case, I, th- I think that's actually one of the few times that I actually will accept someone comparing something to yelling fire in a crowded theater because that's actually – a good comparison where you actually have similar behaviors at issue. And the problem with people talking about fire in a crowded theater is not that it's completely incorrect to say that you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Uh, It depends on a lot of different circumstances, such as what was the person's state of mind? Was it reasonable for them to believe there was a fire? Were they in a play where fire was one of the lines? But there are times when if you intentionally shout fire falsely in a crowded venue and cause harm, that you could actually face liability, something like a disorderly conduct citation. But that's not the problem with fire in a crowded theater because Nobody other than possibly Hugo Black, who's been dead for a long time, thinks the First Amendment is absolute. The problem is that the Supreme Court has narrowly defined specific categories of speech that are not protected and said we don't have this ad hoc balancing test for just anything we don't like. And when people say fire in a crowded theater, they're almost always just using it as a as almost a cheat code to say, well, of course, the First Amendment doesn't protect this speech because you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. And more often than not, when they're saying fire in a crowded theater, the speech that they want to put someone in jail for or have someone sued or fined for actually is protected by the First Amendment. So that's the big problem with fire in a crowded theater. Now, Pulling a fire alarm, if that's what happened, and I don't know all of the circumstances behind what happened with Congressman Bowman, that false alarm, pulling an alarm falsely, that's not protected speech. So that's actually something where the comparison is valid. I'll let that slide. So I think this is actually a a nice framing for the book, 
And you've written a number of books on speech. You wrote a really fabulous, I think, the definitive history of Section 230. Uh, And then you've also written a great book more recently on First Amendment protections for anonymous speech. So why did you choose the First Amendment protections for false speech as your next topic? In particular, why, why now did you feel like it was a good time to write this book? Well, I'd been really following and participating in a lot of debates around Section 230 in particular. And one of the big criticisms that people would have of Section 230 is they'd say, well, it allows platforms off the hook for misinformation. And my reaction to that is, well, maybe if you're talking about defamation, that could be true because it just says that you sue the person who posted the content and not the platform. But I would push back and say, well, but there's not a general exception for misinformation to the First Amendment. So with or without Section 230, for most misinformation, you're not going to be able to sue a platform or the speaker. And uh, there really started to become a lot of uh, proposals in the United States and also globally to address fake news, whether it be about election administration or vaccines or COVID precautions. And so much of what was being proposed by people who otherwise I would think should know better uh, is protected by the First Amendment. And when I would say that, I would often get a response, well, you know, all, all that's required for a change to the First Amendment is five justices to to say, hey, let's narrow these protections a little bit. And I thought that it was really necessary to take perhaps a difficult position of saying uh, not only what the First Amendment protects in terms of false speech, but why it should continue to protect that false speech and the various reasons why courts and legislatures over the years have uh, impose these protections. So the the first half of the book is sort of a series of chapters where you march through some different categories of false or misleading or harmful speech that is nevertheless protected by the First Amendment. Well, you know, without recapitulating every sort of detail of the book, what do you think are the most important categories of false but protected speech, either sort of in and of themselves or just that people don't realize? And therefore, it's really important for someone to make very clear that such and such is, in fact, protected. Well, so I think um, a lot of things involving science are protected for various reasons, both because we want to encourage debate and we and the scientific consensus might change. And also because it's not terribly effective for the government to say you cannot say make the scientific claim. And um, you think about, and I talk in the book quite a bit about during COVID, the very earliest days of the pandemic, there was the government line that COVID is not airborne. And remember, we all had to wash our hands for 10 minutes a day and all- all, Disinfect grocery bags. That was fun. Yeah, it was all surface based and masks wouldn't give any protection and don't buy masks. And then- that started to change. And that's fine. I mean, that's that's the point of science is that you have, you, you allow these hypotheses to be tested. But the problem with saying we're going to regulate this misinformation is that that freezes and stops the debate altogether. And I encounter so many people who are certain that there would be no problem with the government being able to declare the one truth and tell people you cannot question this other truth. And I I think that not only does that stifle scientific debate, but that also is not terribly effective because people will probably start questioning the government line even more if the government is threatening people with litigation or prison time because they're questioning what it's saying. And so, so, but, but there, there are far too many people who do think, you know, misinformation as a category is exempt from the first amendment. Now there are certain types of misinformation. If it rises to the level of defamation and meets the various common law and first amendment standards, then yeah, that's that kind of misinformation can 
be outside of the scope of First Amendment protection. And uh, Fox News was about to learn that right before they settled for $787 million with Dominion. And so so there's st- it, it's, again, not absolute, but you have to get very granular and look at the actual legal tests, not just wave a magic wand and say, we don't like this speech, so it's not protected. So let's stay on the topic of scientific information. As you point out, I think very correctly, one reason to provide strong protections for even incorrect scientific claims is because that's how science progresses. And yet there does seem to be whole swaths of society and the economy where the government actually regulates scientific information very carefully. So I'm thinking here of the FDA regulating often in extreme detail what exactly a pharmaceutical company can claim about its products. And in fact, the one area in which the FDA does not do that, so so called supplements, is actually a cesspool of nonsense. Uh, you know, h- h- how do you square sort of th- those two those two facts? They seem at least in in, in tension. Well, so I I think that one one of the categories that does receive less protection is commercial speech. So claims about products and services and, and and there's good reason for that. So, I mean, the, the Congress right at the beginning of the pandemic passed an amendment to the federal trade commission act that gave the FTC uh, even stronger powers under its unfair and deceptive trade practices statute to go after companies that were peddling bogus COVID cures with the idea that, this is that that commercial speech overall is different from scientific debate because it's act it's it's a company trying to sell a product or service. So I, I think I, I think it's fine that the FDA has those powers, but I, I also think that's different than saying you know a doctor or even a spectator on social media or in a newspaper cannot come out and question uh, vaccines or masks or uh, various other scientific conclusions that the government's reached. Well, let, let, let's stay on that because I actually do think the issue of commercial speech and the lower level of First Amendment protection that it provides or that it gets, I, I actually have always thought that that was sort of a, an interesting part of First Amendment doctrine and and sort of often under-theorized. Because you know, if you actually look at across society, the amount of speech that just that just does not fall within first amendment protections it's actually enormous right i mean the category of commercial speech is very big right we're talking about labeling we're talking about you know anything a public company can say you know we're talking about sec regulation we're talking about i mean there's a huge swaths of the economy are regulated primarily through the regulation of speech and i guess what i've always struggled with is is how to neatly draw the line between those two, right? If if free and open debate, including of mistaken facts or misinformation or lies or whatnot, is so important to democracy, and I tend to agree with you on that point, we, we do then seem quite cavalier about how much speech actually is regulated in society. So maybe the answer should be we shouldn't regulate that speech, but I would hate to live in a world in which you know, there were no limitations on what a public company could claim about its finances when selling stocks or what a pharmaceutical company could claim about its new medicine. And I just never quite known how to, uh, how to, how to harmonize those things and, and where to draw the line uh, between your know, speech that's quote unquote merely commercial and speech that's otherwise important part of democracy or autonomy or expression or whatnot. Yeah. I, I think that it gets down to the nature of what is being communicated. So is it to sell a product or service? And I agree, there are some difficult blurry line cases, but there are for all areas of the First Amendment. So for example, uh, what one thing that I think it's dangerous is that people will repeatedly state, you know, Citizens United was the first time that a company ever received First Amendment protection, which is nonsense. Uh, I would point them to the New York Times versus Sullivan, which I write about in the book, which was decided in 1964, which gave the New York Times substantial protection. uh, And that was based on an advertisement. So you could even say, you know, was that a product or service? But 
but the context of that was was an editorial claim, and I mean, I think that's even a closer call. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I think that there there are some closer calls, but I, I think it ultimately comes down to what the speaker is actually trying to do with the information. Are they trying to sell a product or service? So let, let's then talk about some of the different justifications for strong First Amendment protections. The one that you start with, and the one that I think is generally used by the majority of folks who talk about free expression and free speech, even if they do so implicitly, is the idea of the marketplace of ideas. And you give what I'd say is sort of a, a qualified defense, right? You recognize the flaws uh, of that argument, but you, I think you also push back against folks who try to sort of throw away the marketplace of ideas as a useful model for how speech works. So just d describe what the argument is and where you think it's strong, where you think it's weak, and why you think it's still a useful part of First Amendment discourse. Yeah, so the marketplace of ideas, interestingly enough, at least in uh – U.S. judicial opinions was popularized by Oliver Wendell Holmes, who just months before, this was in 1919, just months earlier, actually was the one who popularized the fire in a theater line. Uh, and o over the summer, in between the two opinions, he, what, Thomas Healy wrote a group, an amazing book called The Great Descent, which um, talks about his year of basically being informally lobbied by some fairly radical free speech scholars about how he was wrong about saying the First Amendment is very limited. And uh, he wrote a dissent in a case called Abrams versus United States in late 1919, where he um, basically said that rather than uh, immediately resorting to putting someone in prison for their speech. This, In this case, it was someone who's criticizing the, uh, the U.S. military efforts in Russia that um, he said the ultimate good desired is better reached by free trade and ideas, that the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. And so it's the idea that, you know, the truth and the good speech will rise to the top and the market will take care of it. It's a very, very laissez-faire approach, which has been the underpinning of so many other court opinions since he wrote that. And I think that while it has been very influential, it's not been the only reason why false speech is protected. And as I write about in the book, it's also not completely satisfying because this is not a perfectly functioning market. Um, everyone does not have equal access to the marketplace. Uh, I would say, and ever, since everything does go back to Section 230, I would say that Section 230 does help with that marketplace by, I, I think it was responsible for the business models for many social media and other platforms where user content is posted. And so I think that at least gives people some bit of entry uh, so even if you're not rich and powerful, you still could participate in the marketplace of ideas. Uh, but even then, uh, some random person with 100 social media followers is not going to have Kim Kardashian's access to the marketplace of ideas. Um, people in marginalized groups often do not have the same access to the marketplace of ideas. So there are some pretty big shortcomings of that. But again, that's not the only reason why courts and legislatures have protected false speech. Well, so let, let, let me actually pick up the point about marginalized groups, because I think that's actually, you know, at least from intellectual circles, which tend to lean sort of generally left, at least in today's world, the biggest pushback you get when talking about the First Amendment or values of free expression generally is a skepticism that the marketplace of ideas really is a fair market and uh, a sort of corresponding worry that the First Amendment really simply kind of reinscribes power relations and simply helps those who are already the most powerful, right? Um, you know, Marianne Franks, who's a professor at, at GW, uh, a few years ago wrote a book called The Cult of the Constitution, where she sort of puts the First Amendment in that in that category. Um, and I think a lot of um, skepticism on college campuses about um, free expression also comes from the concern that, you know, People are only using free expression to to harm people that uh, are already disenfranchised. And I'm curious. Obviously, you, I, I, you don't fully accept that critique, but I wonder if 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 what you, dis, you disagree with it is 
the kind of empirical claim that the First Amendment and free expression simply helps the powerful or more of a, well, even if it is kind of unfair, there's, there's no better system. We have to take the good with the bad. I, I think that it's both. I mean, I, I, I think that I, I think free speech and, and sort of the exceptionalist free speech that we have in the United States compared to most other countries in the world is more empowering to groups than a system in which the people in control get to decide what, what people say. And, and I mean, that gets to beyond the marketplace to other reasons. Uh, I, I write about uh, Alexander M- Mickeljohn. Uh, he basically had the main competing theory for free speech protections to homes in the marketplace. And that's this idea of self-governance that you need to protect speech. And he, he advocated for very strong spe- protections for public speech uh, because that's the only way that you could have an informed public that can choose their leaders and participate in democracy. And so I, I think when, when you look beyond, because I, I think I, I agree with a lot of the critiques that the marketplace is not a terribly satisfying justification by itself because it's not. It, it, you can't just say, oh yeah, just go participate in the market. Uh, that's not always going to work, but there's other reasons. And um, when we, in the book, I look at other countries that all have their justifications for passing fake news laws, and they don't have anything like the First Amendment or anything even close, and they're able to do it. And they have all of their rational justifications that misinformation is poisoning democracy and all, all, all of their reasons. But even in sort of the Western democracies, what you see is politicians, once they get power, they will use that power for their own ends and they, and they will use it to suppress dissent. And you see that with regulations on false speech. So I think the self-governance theory, when you combine it with marketplace and some other reasons, I think that paints a fuller picture of why it becomes dangerous to start whittling away at the First Amendment. I want to turn to the question of the First Amendment in the context of new technology. Um, you know, One point that you make is that the First Amendment has often shielded publishers of factual information from how that information is used. So you give the example of a publisher of a encyclopedia of mushrooms um, who was sued after someone used it and accidentally harmed themselves because they ate the wrong mushroom, right? Because mushroom identification is hard and uh, tricky and high stakes. And I'm curious whether you think the existence of you know generative AI tools like ChatGPT uh, and the potential for you know, a, a orders of magnitude more false and dangerous information, right? Simply because these models hallucinate and they make up facts. D- does that change at all your view of where the balance should be struck? On the one hand, in terms of protecting publishers, on the other hand, protecting consumers? Yeah. So, I mean, I I talk in the book about this justification based on personal responsibility of the recipient of the information. And I, I think that AI is getting a lot of attention. It has been for much of this year, understandably. Uh, but I also think it becomes dangerous to really revamp First Amendment doctrine and protections based on hypothetical concerns about AI. And I mean, may, perhaps they will come true. But the other, the flip side could be that if people exercise just a modicum of responsibility, that they're going to be more cautious with the information that is coming from AI and perhaps um, wa- want to do more to verify it before acting on it. And I, I think maybe that's not going to happen. Maybe I'm being too optimistic, but I I really worry that we're, I mean, I, I can't even count the number of re- reporter calls that I have about these crazy hypotheticals about AI mass defaming people. And, but, but the real test cases they have is someone types into chat GPT asking about themselves and chat GPT says something wrong to them. And you know, that that's a little different. And so, so I, I think it's important to think about, but I also don't, that, that that's not really at the top of my concerns in terms of false speech and the harms that it could cause. I mean, more generally, though, I guess, 
you know, if, if we're entering into a world where the amount of speech is about to expand exponentially because of generative AI, do you think that has implications one way or another for how the First Amendment should think about um, that speech? Uh, you know, I, I don't think that, it, that it, I, I think the fact that we're going to be having a lot more speech does not, I, I think we still need to stick with our principles. And uh, I mean, th this is the whole idea. I mean, in Rick Hassan's book that came out last year about the cheap speech that came from what Eugene Volokh really uh, presciently <laughs> predicted back in the 90s with the internet was that, yes, we are going to have more speech, but at the same time, we don't, we, I, I think one thing that Rick did really well in his book was he set up a framework for dealing with this. And for him, it was in the political and elections context that really stuck to the general principles of the first amendment, but dealt with this large amount of new speech in a, an intellectually consistent manner that did not stray from the protections. And I, so I, I think with AI, it's going to, we're going to have to do the same thing and it might be more challenging, but I, I do think that that that's what we'll have to do rather than just say, this is just too much speech. We're going to have to really overhaul how we deal with speech regulation. Another new, although at this point it's not that new technology that has, I think, huge implications for first for the First Amendment is the rise of social media platforms and the fact that today so much of speech is expressed on these private platforms. And you know, one can look at that and say, well whatever you think about the first amendment, it's just not that relevant anymore because ultimately if I am spending my time speaking on Twitter or Facebook or TikTok or whatnot, it's really the decisions of private entities um, that are going to really determine whether or not I can speak. And so the first amendment while obviously still playing a role somewhere is just no, no longer the most important protection I have protections that I have are contractual or just based on the business imperatives of Mark Zuckerberg or, or Elon Musk. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious what you think of that potential displacement of the First Amendment by market forces. So I, I'm going to disagree with you. I still think the First Amendment's the most protected uh, because as scary as Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk are, uh, they cannot put you in prison as of now, at least. And I think there are other countries where people are going to prison for what they post on social media. And I think we might take that for granted a little bit. So yes, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg can kick people off of social media. In a better world, there would be more competition. I, I, I write about uh, in the book some of these uh, alternative social media platforms and the federated technologies and more more that will develop. And I, I think that uh, this is another area where the marketplace is far from perfect, especially because of things like network effects, which make platforms more valuable when they have more users. So you're never going to have a perfectly functioning market where people can easily uh, go from one social media service to the other if they don't like their moderation system. But I, I think that the moderation policies of platforms are not nearly as scary as, let's say, Russia saying you go to prison for 15 years if you incorrectly call it an invasion of Ukraine. Th those are very different things. I think it's a very fair point. Maybe then sort of drawing it sort of closer to sort of contemporary debates then, you know, you come out, I think, pretty strongly against attempts by the government, and it's mostly been state governments, or it's been exclusively state governments so far, to limit what technology companies can do in terms of content moderation. So, you know, the, obviously, the famously here, the, the Florida and Texas laws that the Supreme Court has agreed to hear next year in the net choice cases. And uh, I, you know, I understand the, the precedential argument and where Tornillo comes in and all, all of that. But I'm curious why you think that sort of putting all the precedent to aside, the best expression of the First Amendment is to limit the government's ability to limit private platforms ability to kick people off those platforms. Because at least the way I see it, there's a good First Amendment argument that at least the values of the First Amendment, if not the specific 
uh, provisions of the First Amendment should actually encourage that kind of government regulation you know, if it's done well, which you know, it may not be. So I'm kind of boring old school First Amendment guy who looks at the state action. And so I don't want the government forcing social media platforms to kick people off or to keep people on. I want the government out of it. And I understand the argument about free speech values. I get that. I'm very concerned. And I I think overall, um, and a lot of people will disagree with me, I think the Fifth Circuit largely got it right in the Missouri v. Biden case. I think there are some flaws in some of its analysis, but that's the case involving jawboning, this uh, coercion or significant encouragement by the government to kick people off or delete certain speech. Um, that I, I don't like them doing that. I don't think they should. But at the same time, a social media platform should have the First Amendment right to decide whether it wants that speech on on its platform. And if a company wants to be very aggressive about speech that it views as hateful or misinformation, the government should not tell the company that it cannot do it. It might be a very unwise choice and the company might end up losing users, uh, but it also might lose users if it's not aggressive enough. And ultimately, this should be an issue that is dealt with by the marketplace uh, and not by I mean, you look at the initial Florida law that restricted moderation and it had an exemption for companies that had theme parks. Um, I mean, this is, that's the kind of nonsense that you're going to get when you have the government dictating content moderation rules. So, and, and I get that, right? And the Florida law, not to mention the Texas law has, has huge flaws in it, but I just want to understand sort of the nature of the objection to those kinds of laws, right? Is it sort of fundamental or is it based on the details of what we've gotten so far? Because it seems to me that while your argument is the straightforward application of, of precedent, we can separate the question of whether the government can explicitly or implicitly pressure companies to take stuff down, right? Which I think we can all agree is not good under the First Amendment. But that just seems very different than the question of whether the government can force companies to keep things up. Because, you know, if the answer is to get the government out of this entirely, then it seems like a lot of the other remedies that we'll get to later on the conversation, whether it's, you know, antitrust to break up monopolistic platforms or whether it's civics education or whatever the case is. I mean, that's also potentially coercive. And I, I guess, you know, uh, and I, th- I feel like I'm sort of picking on p- picking on you for this when more, more when more it's just kind of a frustration of mine generally in this debate. Um, th- there just seems to be this kind of reflexive resistance to letting the government get involved in in this when it seems like that would actually really enhance First Amendment values? I think the government getting involved in speech regulation never enhances First Amendment values. Uh, And and I I would actually push back on your idea that everyone agrees that jawboning is bad. Um, Well, I I just think you you and I I, I think it's bad, but I think there's actually a lot of people who uh, at least see what happened in Missouri v. Biden and say it's fine. And so I think the problem is that when you you think about the baseline, let's say that let's say that a state were to say that social media platforms cannot do any content moderation, that every user, every bit of user content that comes in, they have, they have to transmit that, that would make the platforms unusable because you would have beheading videos. You would have all sorts, uh, you'd have spam. You'd have, even if you said they can only moderate content, that's not constitutionally protected. There's still a lot of really useless garbage that would make the experience almost unusable for platforms. Okay. You say, well, they can moderate spam and they can, and and the government will say, this is also what you can moderate. That is the government making choices about what content the platforms can take down. And these are people who have to run for office, who have to collect campaign donations, who have to stand for election. And now suddenly they are the ones who are influencing what content the platforms are able to take down. And I, I mean, that, that is just so susceptible to abuse that 
it, it's th- there's not a workable solution for for it because when you have when you have a law that's the government making value choices and i don't like them doing that when it comes to speech so l- let's then turn to the things that you think the government can do usefully and one of the things that you suggest is increasing civics education and increasing media literacy and, and I will admit, I'm often skeptical of those kinds of solutions when I read sort of public policy and, and law books. I feel like there's like often a, if we just taught people more civics, they'd be better people and that would solve these problems. But you actually give a really interesting example of why for this particular case, increasing education might be useful. And in particular, you talk about what Finland has done with respect to Russian propaganda. And so I was hoping you could just describe that. And why it's been so successful and like what something like that could look like in the U.S. context. What Finland has done, because Finland has been dealing with Russian propaganda for quite some time. And what they've done is they've really embarked on a K through 12 and really post-secondary initiative to teach media literacy. So starting with kindergarten, they teach people about fairy tales and uh, what what they do that I think is so effective that I think, unfortunately, a lot of people who claim to be disinformation experts in the United States don't do is that they don't make many value judgments about the content. They're not telling people, hey, this specific commentator is probably linked with the Kremlin somehow. Uh, what they do is they they teach more about the tools to verify the information. So how do you look for the source behind the story? What, how, how, what, what are ways for you to tell that this is a news outlet that actually has reporters and editors and that sort of thing? And I think that's really important. And that's missing in, at least in a lot of parts of the United States where, you know, that you, you don't necessarily get those tools for especially how to deal with information that you're receiving on the internet. So it's not saying this is or is not fake news because that gets a little ministry of truthy for the government to be saying that, but instead saying this is, you know, if you were to confront this, this is, these are some ways that you might be able to verify. I want to close out our conversation by asking a couple of sort of larger, bigger picture questions. And the first is I'm going to characterize your argument in a particular way. And I'm curious if you agree with it. It seems like you are generally pretty satisfied with the legal status quo here. You know, whether it's how the First Amendment has generally been interpreted or whether it's how Section 230 has generally been interpreted, you you seem to, you seem to, to think that like we're at a good place. And so my, my questions are twofold. Like one, is that an accurate description of your argument? And two, how sure are you that the current status quo like happens to be the optimal equilibrium, right? Because maybe one could say, well, you know, what's really happening here is we just got really used to the status quo. And now people who are suggesting First Amendment reforms, that's, that's scary. But it's scary largely because we don't know what that would look like, rather than because we think it's like substantively, substantively bad. Or to put another way, you know, why should we not be skeptical of an argument that's like, everything is fundamentally fine. Don't mess with the law on this issue. So I definitely don't think everything is fundamentally fine. And I'm also not necessarily advocating for the status quo to remain forever. Uh, My broader argument in the book is that we have to be far more careful than many people have been in suggesting reductions in free speech protections in the United States to deal with misinformation, because we often don't think both about how effective they would be and also the potential for abuse. So I'm not saying, you know, that that the Supreme Court can never rethink some of its protections. Of course it can. And I think, I mean, we've seen in the past few years, the Supreme Court definitely rethinks many of its precedents that people had assumed were settled. Um, the, but And I'm under no illusions about being able to do that in the First Amendment context. And there might be situations where that might be called for and it might be in the best interests. But what I'm asking is for people to just slow down a little bit in their proposals. Um, and this is coming from the left and right. Uh, this is, and, and I should state, 
I'm speaking only on my behalf, not on behalf of the DOD, Department of Navy or Naval Academy. Um, but I will say that I, I hear things that really scare me from all sides of the political spectrum. A lot of the proposals to really um, regulate false speech have come from the left. And it's people who are very concerned about people on the right being a threat to democracy. So they say, well, the way that we deal with that is we put people in prison for making false claims about election administration. That's something that Washington state's governor supported last year. And I think that if you're really concerned about people who are authoritarian and a threat to democracy, it baffles me that you would advocate for a law that if they got into power, they would be able to jail their political opponents. Like the, it, it, it's so incredibly short sighted and that's been my frustration over the past few years is to see people who ha they have good intentions. I mean, they, they really legitimately think that there is a true threat to democracy and whether you agree or disagree, that's their thought, but they don't think the next step out, which is okay. Well, let's say that you reduce the speech protections and let's say you even get courts to agree with you. You're not getting them back. If you lose the election and your opponents end up in office, they're not going to say, oh, those those speech restrictions, it was only for you guys because you're the good guys. We're never going to use them. I mean, that it's so incredibly short-sighted for people who claim to care about the threat of authoritarianism. So that that's my argument, is that uh, we need to be very careful. Uh, and we're, we are one of the rema few remaining sovereigns that has this level of free speech protections. And I worry that if we don't hold that that's really, we're, we're really going to see this great recession of speech globally. I think that's a good and sobering way to end the conversation. It's a really, really good book, Jeff, and it's a big contribution, especially for those who are kind of less familiar with the really broad protections the First Amendment provides. And so I really urge readers who are interested to to read the book. It's also, as all of your stuff is, compulsively readable, which is a rare thing for a law book. So Jeff Kossoff, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare podcasts by becoming a Lawfare Material supporter through our website, lawfaremedia.org slash support. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. The podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell, and your audio engineer this episode was Noam Osmond of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thanks for listening.